Bible study. So glad you could join us, and uh, we look forward to a good time together in the Word and in the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. Thank you that your blessings are upon us. Thank you that Jesus is Lord, and that as we uh, speak and teach from the Word of God, light comes, revelation comes to all listening, and uh, they're strengthened in faith. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God. Well, good to have you tonight. Glory to God, and uh, trust that you're having a great week in the Lord. And I was kind of waiting for it to pop up on my Facebook so that I could uh, share it and uh, get that stream out there. Glory to God, and um, hallelujah. Uh, God's good all the time. It's another wonderful day in Jesus. Praise God, and Glory. There we go. We, I think we're just popping up live now. There we go. All right. Got to share it. Tell everybody we're here. Praise the Lord. We're out there and ready to roll. Glory to God. Well, welcome. And uh, glad you're here. You can uh, share and you can also let us know. Praise God that you're out there. Amen and amen. Praise God. All right. We're going to continue our study on... Um, um, Faith foundations. We talked about last week. We began talking about the seven steps or the seven um, seven important uh, aspects of achieving the uh, highest kind of faith. And so um, we will continue that. Last week we talked about number one is understanding or having a revelation of the uh, of God's word, uh, the integrity of God's word. And then we went from there and talked about. Uh, the uh, having a revelation of our redemption in Christ. And then we want to tie right into that, praise the Lord, and jump down here and talk about the reality, having an understanding of the reality of the new creation, having an understanding of the reality of the new creation. Praise God. Hallelujah. Um, look with me, if you will, over into first, uh, Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Glory to God. And uh, we'll look down here. We'll actually start in verse 16. Glory to God. And it says, Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, and through though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature or a new creation or a new species of being that never existed before, um, as, as one uh, translation actually says. Hallelujah. And, um, and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ, Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, or that's old English for to know, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you, in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now I'll read that last verse again, <clears throat> because the words to be are italicized, which means they are not in the original Greek, they're not there added by the translators because they thought it would make it read smoother or have a better flow, but it's not there. So let's take that out because I'm not, I'm not changing the Bible. Um, this is not in the Greek. This was added again, and that's why it's italicized, so you know it's not there. They, they thought it would make, make a nicer flow to the way it was worded, but let's take it out, okay? Um, for he hath made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And so we have here this verse uh, 
<clears throat> becomes the very crux of, of Christianity, of redemption, of um, our ability to leave the kingdom of darkness and come into the kingdom of God's dear son. Because this verse is, in, in, encapsulates the very idea of identification, <clears throat> of identification in Christ. Praise the Lord. He has made him sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And we can state it this way. He became what we were so we could become what he is. Righteous before God, he, he was made sin, took our penalty, took the curse of sin, took the very uh, penalty of sin, defeated sin, rose up from the bonds um, that would not suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Suffered him, and he rose up. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Raised from the dead, let all the angels of God worship him. And God brought him forth. And made, and at that mo moment of, of his blood being put on the mercy seat of God, the plan of redemption being consummated and made available to all who will believe. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <clears throat> now we can identify with him and become the righteousness of God in Christ. Please do not run to Romans chapter 3 and try to apply it to the born-again believer. You know, there is an unrighteous, no, not one. Okay? Um, that doesn't apply to the born-again believer. That applies to fallen men outside of Christ who are not born again. Um, Paul actually discussing the case of the Jews and the Gentiles was one better than the other. And... Um, he taught, says in verse 9 of Romans 3, what then? Are we better than they? We're talking about the Gentiles. Jews being better than Gentiles. No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He is talking about the case that the Jews don't have a special place before God that the, Gent, uh, that the Gentiles don't have. You know, somehow now the Jews have a different place before God in their fallen state than the Gentiles have. And here he's making the case. Um, there's none righteous. No, not one. Jew or Gentile are unrighteous outside of Christ Jesus. He goes on and says, there's none that understandeth. There is um, none that seeketh after God. They're all gone out of the way. They're all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of bitterness and cursing. Um, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. They've not, uh, they, the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is made is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, listen, listen, unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified, or that word really can be um, interpreted to say, being declared righteous freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. 
<clears throat> notice that when people pull this out and go, there's none righteous, no, not one, you're not righteous. That's sad. I mean, they get all the huffy puffy going on. They don't read the Bible. To put this in, to take that out of context is, does a disservice. Because it's clearly in reference to Paul uh, discussing the case that the Jew and the Gentile are lost without God in this world. And they need Jesus. The Jews may have the law, but none can be made righteous by the law. The Jew Gentiles outside the law are guilty without the law. Hello? Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But look what he said back up there. He said, uh, but now the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. I love this. Unto all, what's that mean? Jew or Gentile. And upon all, what's that mean? Jew or Gentile, doesn't matter. This righteousness will come upon all and unto all, whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, through faith in Jesus Christ, because there's not a difference. Hallelujah. So when Paul comes over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is in him. This understanding, when he, so when he writes, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things become new. Jumps down to verse 21. Uh, therefore, um, he who knew no sin was, I mean, see, he goes on and says, For he who knew no sin was made sin that we might become who? Unto all and upon all them that believe. Unto all and upon all them that believe. By faith in Jesus Christ, you become the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Or Christ Jesus. For someone to come out and start quoting Romans chapter 3 and say, there's none righteous, no, not one. They are not following the progression of Paul's revelation, his declaration that outside of Christ there are none righteous, neither, neither a Jew or a Gentile. And that's really his, that's his argument here in Romans 3. Has nothing to do with nobody's not righteous. It's that everybody's unrighteous, everybody's sin, everybody's come short of the glory of God. But the right, the, I love it. But now, the righteousness of God is revealed. Hallelujah! Now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. When? Now. Not when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be. Not when we stand on Jordan's stormy banks and look over in the Canaan land. Not when we all get up and, and we, we're in the circle and we're not going to have the circle broken. Hello. Not, you know, one of these days when we get in the sweet by and by. No. Now is the righteousness of God without the law, without the law manifested. Glory to God. Can I get an amen out there? Hallelujah. Or a happy, a happy heart or a happy clappy or something. Glory to God. And so Paul's saying that this righteousness, now if, if you'll read Paul's writings, you can kind of, and, and I, I believe it is, um, I want to say Weymouth. I believe it is Weymouth. In his, in his, um, uh, version will call this righteousness faith righteousness and when he talks about the righteousness of the law he will call it referred to as law righteousness faith righteousness and law righteousness thank y'all for uh, checking in there and let me know you're there hallelujah glory to God so law righteousness is no no flesh can be justified faith righteousness is Upon all and unto all who believe. Why? Because it's faith in the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. And then we go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, and we pick up, For he who knew no sin was made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Glory to God. What a glorious statement. 
I mean, to, under, to, to think of the, the miraculous power and the glorious result of the new birth, praise God, where we were lost without hope, without God, as Gentiles, we were outside the covenants with the Jews. Although they were under the covenant, the law could not make them righteous. It was a schoolmaster to tell them they couldn't make them righteous. So all were unrighteous. All had sinned. All had come short of the glory of God. All were out of favor with God. <clears throat> but a work of redemption was accomplished. Jesus Christ became sin for us. He bore the penalty of sin. He bore the weight of sin. He bore and, uh, and was, uh, uh, suffered the penalty of sin and was raised up for our justification, the Scripture says. Our what? Justification, our being declared righteous. How? By faith. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested by the faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all who believe. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Think of the state of man outside of God, outside of a relationship with God, even under the old covenant Jewish a sacrificial system. They had to stand outside the presence of God. They could not be in his presence. He was in the Holy of Holies of the tabernacle. And before that, the, um, the uh, I mean, and then after that, the temple, he was in the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest once every year could enter in, not uh, with, uh, but not without blood. He had to go in with blood, and put on the mercy seat of God. To be able to, to perform that one service annually, everyone else had to stand without the court. And they were reminded every year, every year, every year. They had to bring sacrifices every year, every year, every year, every year. And during the year, whenever they missed the mark, they had to, had to have a sacrifice going on. But annually, they had to bring that, that every year at Passover, they had to bring that sacrifice. And could not commune with God could not have a relationship with the Father. Really, Jesus introduces him. It's, it's referred to in, in Isaiah, where he should be called the everlasting Father. But Jesus really introduces the, the theological concept of God, not as, you know, uh, the God of heaven, the creator, the almighty. He introduces and re reveals the Father side of God. He talks about my heavenly father. Told him to pray, our father which art in heaven. He pray, when, he, when he prayed, he talked to his father. Glory to God. I said glory to God. And in all that, outside of Christ, man was lost. Man could not have a relationship with God. And so they're thinking of God as the big guy upstairs. You know, who's going to bat you out into left field if you make a mistake? And here comes Jesus to fulfill the Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world for a greater purpose. We've got to go beyond the concept that Jesus came to keep us all from going to hell. Folks, we were already in hell just didn't know it. There is a literal hell that you people go to when they die without Christ. But I am telling you, outside of a relationship with God, you're, you're in a living earthly hell. And so his plan was not to keep you when you died physically from going to the region of the damned and suffering through eternity. His purpose was to reconcile you to the estate, the first estate of Adam in harmonious spiritual relationship with the Father God as a child of God. Hallelujah. How wonderful. How powerful. How glorious is that? So much so that he, remember, 
uh, um, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was willing to be forsaken of the Father and bear our sin penalty in order for us to be restored and reconciled to our relationship with the Father, that position of righteousness. Glory to God. See, when you understand, when you fully understand this, your faith will take on a whole nother dimension. Praise God. Because it won't be based on works. When I mean works, you know, I said I, said I confessed it 4,000 times, and, uh, you know, I believe that I received, you know, and, and, and at the 4,000 times I got it, you know. Hello. It's, it's a work of faith. And so he did that. So it says he was made sin for us who knew no sin. So he had he who was sinless. Tipped in every point like we are yet without sin. Hello. Tempted in every point like we are yet without sin. He was sinless. Jesus never committed sin. But he was made sin so he could pay the penalty and satisfy the claims of justice against fallen humanity, the second Adam, a quickening spirit. Hallelujah. So that we could by faith receive and identify with him in his state of right relationship with the Father. <clears throat> so that we could be declared the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That, my brother and sister, is a powerful, a powerful position. And too often, we don't realize, you know, so, you know, I mean, um, I remember watching one of these home videos from a, a group, and, I, and I'm, not a critic, I'm not trying to be critical, but at the same time, may, and this kind of makes my point. And, you know, they were in there, and one of the guys got to testify, and he got to crying about how and how bad he was a sinner and how horrible, and, you know, he had done all this stuff, and, you know, and, and, and you know, and, and, and you know, th he thanked God that he forgave him. And I honestly thought, this guy, listening to it, this guy had just been living in sin and, and hiding in sin, and all of a sudden just got it straight with God last week, you know, and kind of find out he's talking about years ago. And he's still thinking about just how horrible he is, yet God loved him. Well, thank God when we're, when we, all of us are horrible. It doesn't matter if you're a sweet horrible or a nasty horrible. You're a sweet sinner or a nasty sinner. All the sin that comes short of the glory of God. And everybody must be born again. The sweet person must be born again. The nasty person must be born again. And if you're not born again, you're still sinful. Jesus made it clear when he said, you're of your father the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. So there's not some kind of out because you're a nice sinner. There just isn't. Hello? So when you come into the kingdom of God, God takes whatever you were, whatever you were like, and you're born again, and you become the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, you no longer, because our righteousness, in other words, our efforts, that which we would bring before God will never measure up to his demands. We must bring that which satisfies his claims. Hebrews, the ninth chapter. If you'll run over there with me.
verse, um, verse 6, Hebrews 9. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went as always into the first tabernacle according to the service of God. But into the second, that's the Holy of Holies, went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as yet the first tabernacle was standing, which was a figure, a type, okay? For, for the time then present in which were both offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks, and divers washing and carnal ordinances, Opposed on them until the time of the Reformation. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, that is, that is to say, uh, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into that holy place, once, having obtained eternal redemption, for us, for if the blood of bulls and goats, the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, that was a temporary covering. It's only good for a year. <clears throat> How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hallelujah. Verse 18, wherefore, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of goats, I mean of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament or covenant which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And almost all things by the law purged with blood, and without the shedding of blood, is no remissions. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are figures of the true, but into heaven itself, <clears throat> now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then he must, uh, for then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, but now, once, in the end of the world hath he put, appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered unto bear the sins of many, was once offered to bear the sin of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. So we see the pattern. The priest had to keep going back, keep going back, keep going back. Jesus went in once with his own blood to obtain eternal redemption for us. Glory to God. <clears throat> now we've been made the new creation. He keeps talking about now. Not, see, this, this is the one thing that we do. We, we've got the idea that heaven is when... Um, all of a sudden, we're going to become righteous. We're going to become, you know, this. We're going to become that. The only thing that we don't have manifest now is a, is a redeemed body. We have the seal of the Holy Ghost on the purchased possession, and that's a day coming. Okay? This, this, corrupt, this is still a corruptible mortal body when he returns this corruption shall put an incorruption and this mortality shall put an immortality and we change in the moment in the twinkling of an eye amen 
but our minds can be renewed. Our spirits are born again. We are the righteousness of God. And according to Deuteronomy, we can have days of heaven on the earth. Glory to God. In the here and now, because our redemption, now are we the son of God, sons of God. Not going to be. We are right now. See, we want to call ourselves, we're just a bunch of sinners saved by grace. The Bible calls you sons of God. Heirs of God. Joint heirs with Christ. Heavier every time. Joint heirs with Christ. Think about it. We're not just talking about you got saved and you're some little peon in the kingdom of God. You know, you're a callus on the bottom of the little toe down there and all the sweat and all the, you know, uh, whatever of, of, of your shoes and socks. You are an heir of God, a joint heir with the king of kings and the Lord of lords. <coughs> That's what the word of God says. <clears throat> But we pray, we approach God because of that mindset. We approach God as peons. Well, you know, Lord, you know, I, I, I really don't. Oh, Lord, I, I, I hate that. Oh, God, oh, it's okay. You know, I'll just, uh, I'll take, oh, I'll just, you know. Our prayer life being based on peon theology is inept. It's, it's, it's not full of faith. It's full of doubt and unbelief. Because you don't think you deserve it. You don't think you're worthy. You don't think God will do it for you because you're such a, you know, that maybe he just might because he took a notion to have some kind of random mercy on you for the day. Do it. Oh, my gosh. We need to have that revelation that we stand and, and we are seated in heavenly places. Look, look at Ephesians chapter 2. Look there. Come on, I need some hand clap shouting going on out there. Y'all need to let me know y'all got it. You're with me. Praise God. Chapter 2. There to come. Here to come the hand clap. All right. Thumbs ups. All right. Ephesians chapter 2. And you, half he quick. Now, now really, the half he quickened was moved up from a lower verse because, again, the translators thought it helped. Let's take that out because it's, if we read this, let's, let's kind of follow the real, the real thought of Paul here. It's italicized, not in the Greek. And you, who were dead in trespasses and sins, who were were dead in trespasses of sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. And remember, conversation is an old English word that meant manner of life, the way you lived, the way you conducted yourself. Okay? We all had our manner of life, the way we conducted ourselves in time, uh, times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, just like everybody else. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath. Now, that's King Jimmy for has, which is English past tense. It has been done. Quickness, or made us alive. <coughs> Glory to God. Together, I'm sorry, made us alive with, together with Christ, by grace you're saved. The plan of redemption is a grace that we receive by faith, glory to God, and hath 
raised us, half has again, past tense, raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Not one of these days. I mean, we think of our songs, or some of our old traditional hymns that we love so much. In the sweet by and by. When we gather on that beautiful shore. Hello? Well, how about the sweet now and now? Because this is already established. We've already been raised up together. We've already been seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That is a now fact. Used to work at a restaurant down in the, well, that park was in Greenville. Used to work down there in the, in, uh, in the kitchen. The girls would say, uh, you know, we'd have to fill up the, the uh, food on the table and say, brother, we need some, we need some barbecue on this table right now. And I always love that right now, right now, right now, because I'm righteous right now. I'm seated right now. It's not going to happen in another day. It's not going to happen when I get to the sweet by and by. It's not going to happen when I cross Jordan's stormy banks. It's, going to, it's right now. <coughs> it is a right now reality. Praise God. It's a now happening thing. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace just doesn't come on you. Grace is available but must be received by faith. No way around it. God just don't make it happen to you. Grace is received and it's received through faith. And that not as yourselves, it is the gift of God. Hallelujah. Not of works. Now remember, this is Paul writing. Not of the works of the law, lest any man should boast. Paul refers to works as the works of the law. That's his mind. That is his theological perspectives. When you read his writings and you study him, when he's referring to works, he is referring to the law. Works of the law. Verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Hallelujah. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, a lot of people say, I don't believe in doing it. Well, we're, we're free from works. No, you're created for good works. Your works don't save you, but your works should follow you. Amen. When you're born again, you should, those works should follow you. So here, we have been raised up. When we were dead in our trespass sins, he did quicken us. He hath quickened us together with Christ. We're made alive with him. Glory to God. You have to understand that when you approach the throne of God and you come in prayer, you come in, you come in faith in order to receive from God. Hallelujah. In order to receive from God, you do it by faith. And that understanding of the new creation, that new creation man that is declared righteous. When they came before the king, he had to raise his scepter for them to be accepted. If he did not raise the scepter, they were, they were killed. They weren't worthy to be in his presence. We come clothed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. The scepter is always raised. Hello? Because we stand in his righteousness. His blood has been accepted. Praise God. 
Glory to God. Can I get can I get some hallelujah amens out there? Somebody. Glory. Praise God. Um, look over, if you will, in the first John chapter three. First John chapter three. The first epistle of John. Or as they like to put in, you know, get fancy. The first epistle general of John the Apostle. 1 John 3, 2. Beloved. Don't you just love it? Not sorry, dog sinner, but beloved. Now are we the sons of God. How much theology has been based on one of these days when right here he says, now. Amen. My Martin says children, so can we translate children of God. Now are we the children of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. <coughs> What's he talking about? The full of our redemption is we don't have the glorified body. But when he splits the eastern sky, this corruption is going to put on incorruption. This mortal is going to put on immortality. And we'll be changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. Hello? But we're no less the Son of God with a glorified body than we are without it. How do you know? Because he says, now are we the sons of God. Now are we the children of God. Now. Now. Amen? Verse 14 says, we know that we've passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abides in death. Now are we the children of God. And we know because we love the brethren. I've, I've, I've noticed when people get saved, one of the things that happens is they love everybody. They're hugging folk. They're so excited. They got Jesus. It takes some people teaching them not to love everybody for them to stop loving everybody. Now, that's the fact, Jack. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's the facts, Jack. Praise God. Now, and of course, Colossians 1 talks about Paul knew of the uh, of their love in the spirit. First Peter one twenty three tells us that we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then going back to Ephesians chapter two, we are his workmanship. You, my dear friend, are the righteousness of God in Christ. You have absolute authority right and privilege to stand in the presence of God justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. Praise God. Declared the righteousness of of God in Christ Jesus. <coughs> this is not some made up man thing. This is what the scripture says. And it keeps using present tense application of this reality that now are we the children of God. Hello. This is all about it. So let's, now let's take this. When we come to that realization, when we come to that understanding of the position we have before the Father, that we do not come as beggars. We do not come as sinners saved by grace. You were a sinner. You were saved by grace. True, true, true true, true, all day long. But now, but now, 
We are the sons of God. But now. I was, but now. I don't approach God on who I was. I approach God on who I am. And there's nothing for me to brag about. There is nothing for me to go, Ed Taylor's really one cool guy because he's the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It is a work accomplished by Jesus Christ. He paid the price and he made available to me through faith to receive that gift. But now that I've received it, I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's no longer. I don't ever come before God on who I was. I come on who I am. I come on who I am. And that can transform your faith. Radically transform your faith. Because now when you request, I remember um, as a kid, well, not as a kid, uh, young or married, I was a kid, I guess, when we first got married. Right, honey? <laughs> Wait a second now. I, that was a little innuendo in there. <laughs> she said, yeah, you were. <coughs> we were young. I mean, I was, I was 20, 22. She, yeah, she was born grown up, kind of like uh, Jesse. Um, I was 22, and Janie was 20 when we got married. We had dated for four years. And um, uh, in that two and a half weeks, it would be, th well, three weeks, it would be uh, 40 years. Praise the Lord. Um, but she had not grown up this way. It's just wasn't the way her house was done. But, you know, uh, in my house, my, my family always kept candy, candy bars, whatever. I mean, and they would keep, and, and there's a little, there's a little side cab, one of these little cubby cabinets beside the refrigerator they had this, this thin, thin cabinet. You go on the side there and you open the door and there was, there was always, there were boxes of zero candy bars. Now, I don't know about you. I love being a zero. I don't get them often anymore. I mean, it's a rarity. Uh, I mean, I go months now without eating those things. But I still like a zero bar. Good fresh one. Ooh. Ooh. I mean, make you shout with a glass bottle, Dr. Pepper, with real cane sugar in it. And that's why I can only do it once every three, four, five months. It's a, it's a rarity, but still. But we'd go, 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 to, my, uh, go to the house, walk in, and say, hey, how y'all doing? Walk right past everybody, go over to the cabinet, because we're married now. Open the door, pull out a zero bar, and Janie says, honey, you can't do that. I said, what? You don't live here anymore. So, I'm still a tailor. I know who I was. I had a right to that candy bar. Not once was I ever told, you can't have that. You don't live here anymore. Hello? I knew who I was. She just, just was flabbergasted that I just had the audacity to go grab the candy bar without asking. That's there. I know where they are. It's I have access to it. I don't have to ask. I finally said something to my dad one time about it because, you know, she's so uptight. He said, you don't have to ask about that. Anything you want's yours. I knew that. I needed for her to hear it. She needed to have the revelation that I had access to the zero bars. <laughs> yep. I know what she's thinking, too. And when I go to the gas station, and, and, and would, uh, I'd say, honey, I got to go get gas. And I go get gas in a zero bar. And um, at the gas station, when I was, I was supposed to be dieting. Praise the Lord. But the point was, I was a tailor. And the tailor house had zero bars. And when I drove up in the driveway, walked in the door, I could just walk in and say, hi, how y'all doing? Love y'all, whatever. Or, you know, I'll be right back and walk right over and get my zero bar. And there won't nothing ever said about me not doing it. Because I knew who I was. 
I was, I knew who I was so much I wasn't even conscious of knowing who I was. It's just I had, I had access to it. I had a right to it. We need to come to the point that we are so unconscious about our reality that we, act, we just live by it. We live on it. That we come before the Father. We're not afraid. We're not uptight. We're not scared. And we're not afraid to ask. Ask and you shall receive, he said. Amen. That our faith becomes an extension of our relationship with our Father. And we so know who we are in Christ Jesus that we can receive of him without the struggle and without the worry. Is he going to be angry with me for asking? Hello. Now, you, you, you could come back on the other side of this and go, well, uh, what if you're asked for something you shouldn't ask for? It's not faith. Hello? I said, hello. If you honor God and love God, <clears throat> you're only going to walk in accordance with his word. You're not, going to, you're not going to ask for something that's out of harmony with his word. Hello. Amen. Because you, you know, that wouldn't be right. And you know that because of your relationship. Praise the Lord. Amen. All righty. Well, we're going we're to quit right there. And uh, next week we'll pick up um, and go forward. Praise the Lord. And um, just want you to know that we love you. We appreciate you. We want you to be here on Sunday. Uh, join, come live. Come live. And be, we are in person on Sundays. We're meeting at um, 6701 Ken Coy Road in High Point. Uh, we're using uh, the church facility of New Life Family Church in the afternoons. Uh, so at 1 o'clock, we'll be there and, and having church. Please come out and join us. Be with us. Invite people to come. Get some folks in church. Let's let's get some things done for the kingdom of God. Let's grow and go out there and, and share truths just like we just shared tonight. Boy, does the world need that. Can you say amen? The world needs what we share tonight. They need to come to Jesus. They need to be born again. And they need to be a part of the Father and his family. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, we just want you to know how much we love you and appreciate you. <clears throat> we bless you in the name of Jesus, and we, we, we want to remind you once again, these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you, and we will see you here next time at Faith and Victory Church online. Praise the Lord.